you know, we're all going to go through transitions in life. Whether it's um, high school to college, getting married, moving, having kids, job changes, divorce, all kinds of things. I, um, almost three years ago, went through a transition um, of widowhood. It's horrible, absolutely horrible. But you know, it was devastating what happened. It was a tragic accident that took my husband, and it was life-shattering. I'll be honest, it was. But I had a lifeline. My lifeline wasn't a rope or a thing. It was literally the person of Jesus Christ, the truth. All that Jesus is, I clung on to that for dear life as I was going through this horrible, horrible tragedy. I don't know what you're going through here today, and... Um, but I can tell you this, without that lifeline, I don't know how you'll make it. My story, if you're a mother here, you might want to plug your ears if you have teenage daughters, okay? But I'm going to tell you my story, and it's all true. <laughs> I met Frank Pastore when I was 11 years old, and he was a much older man of 15. I came from Upland, a loud Italian family. My dad was really into baseball, grew up with Vin Scully blaring on the radio and pots and pans clanging, the television blaring. It was a loud house. My brother, my older brother Johnny, went to Damien High School in Laverne and brought over his friend, Frank Pas they called him Frankie Pastore back then. And I don't know what it was about this guy. I, I really can't tell you. I was 11. I wasn't romantically inclined. I didn't have hormones going. But I liked him. He was special. And I liked him. When I was 13, I was now hormonal and now romantically inclined. <laughs> And he still was coming over to the house, and I really liked him. So I started doing what he, he went to high school, as I said, with my brother. And they were on the ball, baseball team together. My brother was his catcher. Frank was the star pitcher. And they started hanging out. And um, I started hanging out with my brother a lot because I wanted to know more about Frank Pastore. So I started asking him questions. What's he like? Who does he date? What do people think of him? You know, that brother-sister kind of thing going on. And my brother was like, well, he's really popular. He's the senior class president. He's a really good baseball player. And I like him. He said, but some people think he's cocky. And I said, why? And he said, because he walks in the room, he takes charge. He's bold. He says things people wouldn't say. I'm thinking, well, I like that. But my brother he said, yeah, some people think he's cocky. So a couple, couple weeks later, I'm in Catholic school, taught and mentored by nuns. And we're in 9 o'clock every morning. We have religion class. So I'm in class. And this morning, sister was going to teach on prayer. Now, I was expecting the usual, praying to saints, praying to Mary, that kind of thing. But this sister didn't, didn't teach that. She, she taught us a lot of theology. We learned about the Trinity. And she said prayer was going into a, a deep time with the Holy God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, the triune being. And she said, you pour your heart out to God. He already knows all about you because he's omniscient and all-powerful. But then, she said, you listen. You listen to what the Holy Spirit tells you. Sometimes he'll talk to you. Sometimes he won't. Well, I was so intrigued with this. I had never heard this before. 
So the next Saturday, I decide I'm going to go in the backyard. She said it had to be a quiet place, so I had to go in the backyard because our house was very loud. So I had my beach towel, and I go in the backyard, and I'm thinking if my parents look out the window, they'll just think I'm sunbathing with no sunblock like we did back, back in the day. So I lay down on the grass. It's a beautiful day, and I start pouring out my heart to God, and I'm saying, God, you know, you know all about me. You're all powerful, and you know I like this Frank Pastore. And I'm only 13, and he's 17. But I like him, and I think I can fall in love with him. So I pray, Lord, I think I want to marry him someday. But if I'm going to marry him, he has to love me back. So my first prayer was that God would, that my husband would love, or my future husband would love me back. My second request was that we would get married. And then my third request, and I must have prayed this because my brother told me that everybody thought Frank was cocky. I prayed that he would be loved by thousands. I don't know where I got thousands, but I, so I prayed that he would love me, that we would get married, and that he would be loved by thousands. So now I was going to listen to the Holy Spirit, as Sister had taught us, you know, that this is, it's a two-way street, she said. It's not just talking, it's about listening. So I'm laying there, and I'm quiet, and I'm waiting, you know, to see if the Holy Spirit talks to me, and all of a sudden I hear, Frank is going to die young. I sat up on my towel. I was like, wait a minute. I was not supposed to hear that. This is weird. I, what am I make of this? I was freaked out. So I decided, okay, I'm going to lay back down, and I'm going to do this prayer all over again. <laughs> so I lay back down, and I pray again, and I wait on the Lord, and very gently I hear, Gina, I hear you, but Frank is going to pass away fairly young. And then the Holy Spirit said, do you still want to marry him? And I said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I do. Two years later, um, Frank had signed with the Cincinnati Reds. He got drafted out of high school. He went off to play baseball and I'm turning 15, I'm in high school now, and I'm thinking, oh, he's going to run off with a baseball groupie, and that'll be the end of it. I just got to get this out of my system, you know. And I'm like, I got to go to high school, I got to date, I got to go out for cheerleading, I got to go to the prom, all that. So I'm really kind of hoping that I don't see him again. Well, he comes home from the ball season, sees me, and goes right to my dad and says, can I take Gina on her first date? My dad says yes, because he knows him and trusts him. So we go out. We go to the, on my 15th birthday. He took me to the movies, and we went to for coffee. I was 15, having coffee at Alfie's <laughs> Diner. But it was the first time I had been alone with Frank because there was always people around. So we start talking, and oh my gosh, now we re I really like him. There's no, this is it. I can't get this out of my system. I like this guy. So um, he brings me home. He says, you know, I'm going off in a couple months to play ball again. Maybe when I get back, we'll date again. We acknowledge our age difference, you know, and so Next year, he comes back, I'm 16, we date, that's it. We're coming out of the closet. We like each other. <laughs> this was kind of scant, you know, especially back then, 16 and a 20-year-old, and he's a baseball player, this is really crazy, you know. So my dad and mom know him. They're okay with it at first. My dad is okay with it. My mom starts to get upset. This is where you want to plug your ears, okay. And um, they start fighting. My parents start fighting. I start fighting with them. There's, you know, chaos going on. So my Frank and I 
we decide, we make a plan, we decide to do what any reasonable 16 and 20 year old would do. We elope. <laughs> that would be a talk for a whole nother time. But um, if you're interested, it's all documented. My husband wrote a book called Shattered, so the whole story's in there. Bef right before we eloped, Frank, as a pitcher, dove into a base, broke a finger on his pitching hand. So after we get married, his finger's healing, but he says to me, you know, we're going to go to spring training. I, I have to play out my obligation to the Reds, but they're probably not going to keep me. They're probably going to release me because I eloped with a 16-year-old girl and I have a broken, had a broken finger. So I'm like, cool. He's like, I really want to go to school. I want to be an attorney. You know, I'm like, that's great. I don't care, you know. <laughs> so we go to spring training and lo and behold, he has the best spring training ever of any pitcher that year and at 21, I'm now 17, he's 21, we are now in the big leagues. We're catapulted into the big leagues. Life was good. Life was good. Oh, there's lumps and bumps in baseball. There's long road trips and there's pressures and there's baseball groupies and all that. But we loved each other and Life was an adventure, and we were, we were good, you know. And um, we had our two children, Frank and Christina. Frank became a Christian towards the end of his ball career. That's an, a long story. You can read it in Shattered. But, and, I, and then a year later, I followed and completely gave myself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Life was good. We knew that after baseball, we'd probably have a career in ministry. We both wanted, you know, to serve the Lord. Frank's ball career ends. We do end up in ministry. Again, there's lumps and bumps in life. It's not perfect by any means, but we love each other, and we can handle anything. We can go through any transition with each other. Frank ends up being offered the drive time talk show here in LA on KKLA, the uh, Frank Pastore show. He takes that job and he is just, he had gone to school, he was a trained apologist. He's in a sweet spot. Life is good. We have, our kids are getting married. Our daughter-in-law and son tell us that they're going to have um, our first grandchild. We have a little grandson. We're mature Christians. Life is good. Life is good. We have more grandchildren on the way. And we're so looking forward to the future. We're so looking forward to the future. But then life threw me a curveball. It was November 19, 2012. The day started out like any normal day. We got up, the alarm went off, got up, did our coffee, had our breakfast, we got on our computers. Frank prepared for his talk show every day, um, you know, going over the news of the day. And um, he went in the bedroom, got dressed early, and he said, oh, I have to go to the studio early today. I have to meet with a client. He came, he kissed me on the cheek, told me he loved me, and on the way out, his cat, he was going to ride his motorcycle, he had his boots on, his boots are clinging on the tile, and he says, honey, tonight's Monday night football, I'm going to get home right after the show and just have dinner on the table. I said, okay, you know. Off he went. The garage door, I heard the, he went through the hallway, the garage door shut, and I was sitting at my computer, and all of a sudden, a weird funny feeling came over me and the Holy Spirit said Gina get up and go tell him you love him and kiss him goodbye and I said what's this about he knows I love him I always argue with the Holy Spirit don't ask me why but. <laughs> so again the voice said get up and go tell him you love him and kiss him goodbye so 
I sat there for a moment, and all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, he's probably ready to leave. So I jumped, and I ran out the door, and he was just about to get on his bike. He had his full-face helmet on, and I went over to him, and he's looking at me like, what are you doing? You know, and I put my arms on him. I said, honey, I love you, and I want to kiss you goodbye. So he had his helmet on, all, on already, and it's hard to take on and off. So he lifted up his visor and bent forward, and I kissed him on the nose. And then I looked in his eyes. My husband was a very happy man. He was smiling. His eyes were twinkling, full of life. And I said, I love you. And he's like, I know. You know, he's wondering what all this is about. He flaps his visor down, hops on his bike, and he backs out of the garage. And I just stood there and watched him leave that morning. He roared down the canyon on his bike. And I just, I remember I just stood on the driveway and um, it was as though time kind of stood still, and I felt so content. I really did. I was thanking the Lord. Uh, the day went on as normal. I didn't, the funny feeling left. I never thought about it again the rest of the day. And 6 o'clock, I remember, oh, he, I have to get dinner going. He wants, you know, Monday night football. I'll have dinner on the table. So, um... I went in the kitchen, I turned the radio on, as I always listen to the Frank Pastore show, and he had on a guest, Professor Keith Matthews, they were talking about um, the reality of the soul. My husband loved, he was an apologist, and he loved talking about reasons for faith, and I loved the discussion, and I was listening, and all of a sudden Frank said, you know, tonight I could be on the 210 freeway, and I could get hit. And I could be all over the 210, but that's not me. That's my body parts. I cringed. He had said this. I had heard him say this a couple times before. He's using himself as an example. But I just kind of cringed and thought, I wish he wouldn't say that. The moment passed. I didn't think about it again. 8 o'clock. He usually got home right at 8 o'clock. And I had dinner on the table, and I'm waiting, and I'm, I'm thinking, oh, I thought he'd be home right on time tonight, you know. Frank and I were very close. He always communicated with me and called me if he was going to be late. I knew way ahead of time, so no call. I checked my phone. 8.15, I'm thinking, well, he hit traffic, or he had to do a commercial or something like that. So, um... 8.30 comes around, and I start to get a pit in my stomach. He hasn't called. That's not like him. I had checked. There wasn't traffic. So anyways, I got that all-familiar pit that you get if you've ever been in this situation where you fear someone's been in an accident. Around a quarter to nine, I decide I'm going to call the studio. I had never done that after the show looking for Frank because he he called me or he was home, you know. So I call and I get his producer and I said, JJ, is, did Frank leave on time? And he said, yeah, he's not home yet. And I said, no. He said, well, I'm going to go down in the parking garage and I'll check. I'll call you back. I have to be honest, I'm already starting to kind of go into shock a little bit. My head is swirling and all that about Fifteen minutes later, J.J. calls back and says, Gina, um, you need to call the CHP. There has been an accident, but I don't think it's Frank. But here's the number. He gives me the number, so I hang up, and I remember I, it took everything in me to press the numbers on the phone. And I got the CHP, and they did um, go ahead and confirm that it was Frank. He was resuscitated and airlifted to USC Medical Center. I was, I went into shock at that point. It's like you're having an out-of-body experience. Almost like you're watching yourself. Part of me wanted to run out the front door and screaming. The other part wanted to get in my car and try to get to USC where I, I didn't even know how to get there. So I called my sister. 
she and my brother-in-law came right over and um, got, we drove to the hospital as fast as we could. It, there was road construction, the freeway was closed. It took us two and a half hours. Finally got there by like 11.30. I had contacted my children, they were on the way and I was greeted by a, a young neurosurgeon and a nurse. They came right out, they brought me in the waiting room. The neurosurgeon looked down at the ground, never looked at me, and just rattled off all of Frank's injuries, multiple broken bones, but he said the most concerning was traumatic brain injury, and I knew what that meant. He brought me back to see Frank, and the man that I had said goodbye to that morning with the bright eyes, and so much life was now laying there like he was asleep. Just like he was asleep. His face was not, because of his helmet, his face was in good condition. He just had a, a split lip that the, they had sewn up. And he wasn't casted yet. They just had his arms and legs wrapped at that point in bandages. And I wanted to just jump in the bed and say, Frank, let's get out of here. This is a bad dream. But then the better part of reason was coming over me saying, this is really serious. I don't know how he's going to come out of this, short of a miracle. <sighs> Frank was in a coma for four weeks. Now I have to tell you, like I told you, I was in shock. I, I was in shock for about three days. And I couldn't eat and all that. But all of a sudden I started to experience in that four weeks something I had never experienced before. I had heard about it. Scripture talks about it. It's called the peace that surpasses all understanding. And I had it. I can't even explain it because it was a horrible, dreadful time. I was already grieving. I was feeling like my whole life was being turned up, you know, up, upside down. A tidal wave had washed over me. But yet at the same time, I was aware that this God that I had always told, you know, many times had ministered to people, you got to trust the Lord, I would say. God's in control, all those things. Now I was having to do that. I was having to trust the Lord. And I said to God, you know, I don't understand this. I don't know why this is happening, but I'm going to trust you, Lord. I had presence of mind. I could minister to people. I could minister to my children. It's hard when you're going through this. You have the other aspects of it. My kids are losing their dad. It, it's just horrible. But God was with me, literally, walking me through each day of that coma. And that lifeline, I was clinging on. The neat thing was my husband was a man of God, and I had the benefits of that as, a, as his wife. We had, my husband would say, you got to have your tank full. I had a full tank. I didn't have to suddenly try to go find God. The God that I knew and had studied about all those years was there, activated. I don't know where you're at, but if you're waiting, don't wait. What are you waiting for? This world can't get any worse. I mean, we, we've talked already this morning about the recent shootings, persecution, cancer, divorce, all kinds of things. We're going to hell in a handbasket. There's nothing to wait for. And if you're thinking, well, I don't want to be a religious bigot, you don't have to be. God takes you just as who you are right now. And then you'll become a religious weirdo, but <laughs> that's okay. We'll understand. December 17th, 2012 was another horrible day. 
Frank had been transported to um, a local hospital. There was nothing more they could do in the ICU for him. And the reality was he wasn't coming out of the coma. He would either pass away or he would be an invalid. And I had been at the hospital that morning praying with, over Frank with a friend. A dear friend came over and I left around noon because I had to go home and sign disability papers and get them in the mail. And then I was going to go right back to the hospital. So I get home from the hospital and they're calling me, telling me, Mrs. Pastore, get right back here. Why? Well, we can't just get right back here. So I know that Frank has probably died. So I get in my car, I race over there, and I get to the hospital. I walk down this long corridor, and the hospital administrator is there with her head down, so I, I know what's happened. I walk towards her, I gr we hug, I'm sobbing, and I'm saying, I left. I was just here this morning, and I left. I went home. And she said, Gina, your pastor was in the room with Frank. I turn the corner, and there's Pastor David and David Bustamani. As soon as I left, they had come to the hospital to see Frank and were in the room with him, praying over him. God's faithfulness was so evident to me. Now, I'm not, I'm not pulling any punches here. It's horrible to lose a beloved spouse or if you've lost a child. There's certain losses that are harder than others, and it is horrible. But because of my lifeline, because of Jesus Christ and all that he claims that he is and he is, we have that hope. We have hope. We know we're going to see our loved ones again. Frank's memorial was right in this sanctuary. Uh, several churches had offered. We were expecting a large crowd. And I said, no, he'll be at our home church. I sat right, right here. And during the service, I had selected speakers that represented my husband's life. It was the Lord really put it together well. It was an awesome service. It was very difficult for me to sit through, but it was, it was awesome. But during that time, I'm sitting there, and I had like this really quiet moment with the Lord. And he said to me, Gina, do you remember what you prayed when you were 13? I had never forgotten, but I had pushed it down. I didn't want to think about it. And all of a sudden, I realized, oh, my goodness. He loved me. We married. And he is so loved by thousands. Thousands of people were writing and sending letters and praying. And it was unbelievable. That prayer time at 13 came full circle. It came full circle because the God that we serve is faithful. He never leaves us, even in our darkest moments. And what he says is truth, absolute truth. You can take it to the bank. You know, I started this morning talking about transitions and how we're all going to go through these transitions, but there's one final transition, we're all going to die. There's no two ways. We're not getting out of that one. There's two things they say you're going to do in life. You're going to pay your taxes and you're going to die. <laughs> Please, don't, don't leave this room, or if you're listening on the internet, don't Leave wherever you are without trusting in Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not a big deal, really. It is, but it isn't. It's, it's like being like a child and just saying, okay, Jesus, 
I need you and I want you in my life and I'm going to entrust all that I am about to you. He's your creator and maker. He knows you already. And don't wait for something bad to turn to him. If you do that, that's fine. He'll be there. Do it now. Don't wait. 